Good morning, and welcome to this Cathedral of the Holy Trinity on this Trinity Sunday. It is our patronal feast day in which we celebrate the ministry and the legacy of this community of faith alongside and a part of our celebration of the community that is God that is three in one, a community rooted and grounded in manifestations of love. Also on this day, we wish a happy welcome and bon fête de maman to all mothers and all those who mother on this Mother's Day here in France. We issue a special welcome to those who are joining us online, wherever you may be doing so. And for those who are here in person, a special reminder that as you see, our center aisle is blocked off so that we have microphones that can support and allow people, our uh, fellow worshipers, wherever they may be, to be as close to us here in the space as possible. And a special last note for those of you who may be sitting near these microphones uh, that uh, you may be picked up should you, uh, should you have anything to offer during the service. So be mindful of that throughout this morning. We are so glad that you are here. And in these final moments before we begin our worship together, I invite us all to find a grounding and presence that the, to the God and with the God who loves us so much that God wishes for us to be, to know that God as parent, as Savior, as Spirit. Welcome. Blessed be God, most holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity. And blessed be God's reign, now and forever. Amen. Let us all pray. 
Almighty, Almighty God, God, to you all hearts are open, open all desires known, and from, from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we, we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us, your servants, grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory. O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Ainsi donc, frères, nous avons une dette, mais non envers la chair pour devoir vivre de façon charnelle, car si vous vivez de façon charnelle, vous mourrez. Mais si, par l'esprit, vous faites mourir votre comportement charnel, vous vivrez. En effet, ceux-là sont fils de Dieu, qui sont conduits par l'Esprit de Dieu. Vous n'avez pas reçu un esprit qui vous rend esclave et vous ramène à la peur, mais un esprit qui fait de vous des fils adoptifs et par lequel nous crions « Abba, Père ». Cet esprit lui-même atteste à notre esprit que nous sommes enfants de Dieu, enfants et donc héritiers. Héritier de Dieu, co-héritier du Christ, puisque, ayant part à ses souffrances, nous aurons part aussi à sa gloire. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the religious authorities. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these things, these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of God be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. Amen. Amen. This week brought the unexpected gift of an email from Joseph Hughes, who is a professor of economics at the State University of New Jersey, otherwise known as Rutgers. He wrote to offer some kind words on a sermon that I preached a while ago, but mostly to compliment all of us on the high quality of the worship services that we offer from here on the internet. It turns out that Joe Hughes watches us very early in the morning 
before going into the city to worship at St. Bart's, where he's a member, a place that at least a few of us here know. Mary Haddad certainly does. So thank you, Joe, for being with us. And thank you to all of you who are joining us from wherever you are around the world as we gather here every Sunday morning, Paris time. We're thankful to have you with us, even if we are just an appetizer on the way to St. Bart's. <laughs> Wherever you are, let us know how you came along with us and how you found us to be part of your faith journey. We are now out there on the internet. We wonder how these things can be, but we are very glad that they are. I've chosen for my text this morning the five words uttered in midnight perplexity by tired and troubled Nicodemus. They are words well worth writing on your heart, because in them lies the beginning of wisdom. Remember a little bit about Nicodemus. He is no average person. He is exceptional. He would fit right in here. He's highly educated. He's highly respected. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. People come to him for knowledge. He knows what he thinks, and he knows why he thinks it. Most men in Nicodemus' position, and at this time in history, they were all men, would have nothing to do with Jesus. They already knew what they thought of him and why they thought it. They were quite sure they were in no need of any further information. Not so Nicodemus. There is something truly wise about Nicodemus because there is something truly humble about him. Humble enough to make him aware that there is still more for him to learn. He hasn't given up what he thinks. He isn't any less sure of his own ideas. He is just prepared to admit that his own knowledge might be incomplete. And so, caught between curiosity and reputation, he comes under the cover of night to Jesus. I sometimes wonder whether if we open the gates here in the small hours of the night, at least some of the people out there living in such certainty about their secularism might bring their questions here under the cover of night. Anyway, after the exchange he has with Jesus, we just heard it when Nat read the Gospel, Nicodemus does not say, you're wrong. He does not say, I am sure my knowledge is superior to yours. He does not say, none of this makes any sense. Instead, he weighs all that Jesus has said to him and all that he knew coming into that room, he sees that both things cannot be true. And he also sees that what Jesus has taught him might just be true. And his response is a prayer in the form of a question. How can these things be? Today is our feast. Today is the Feast of the Holy Trinity. It is the one day in the calendar of the church year dedicated to a doctrine of the Christian faith. The one day that the person standing here must speak to you in some way about theology and make it interesting. Because the idea of the Trinity is a theological claim. But for 2,000 years, as people have tried to explain this and expound on it, as the libraries have accumulated shelves upon shelves of books about the doctrine of the Trinity, most people outside the Christian church, and more than a few in it, have responded in something like the same way. How can these things be? How can we claim to believe in one God expressed in three persons? How can we claim to be part of the Abrahamic family of faith that proclaims God is one? How can we say in the words of the very first of the 39 articles of religion that God is three persons of one substance, power, and eternity? Theologians from St. Augustine to Dorothy Sayers 
have taught us to look for traces of the Trinity deep within ourselves in human nature. Because after all, we are made in the image and likeness of God. And so that seems promising. We'll find some evidence here until you try it. And then, as Augustine himself found, you get no satisfactory answers. So we struggle with this idea. But we might just be missing an easier path, although it is a more dangerous path, too. That path begins in a different place. Instead of starting by looking inside ourselves, start instead from the fundamental Christian claim about the nature of God. It is simply the assertion found in the first letter of John. God is love. Theos agape estin. The impact of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus was so profound on the people who had experienced it that this was their conclusion. God is love. Not that God is the source of love. Not that God is like love. That God and love are two ways of saying the same thing. And when the world around them heard them say this, their scandalized response was, how can these things be? God is judgment. God is righteousness. God is wrath and anger. That is the God we know. And even today, it is the God that more than a few Christians seem to prefer. But here is where our story begins. God is love. We already know that. So what might we learn from that about the Trinity? More than anything else, even more than our faith in the resurrection of an executed convict, those three words are the most radical claim of the Christian faith. And they are not just a claim about our faith, but about us, about Christians. Because we are taught that we are to love one another as God has loved us. That is what makes us Christians. Love each other without self-interest or self-regard, without condition, and without hesitation. There is a glimpse of a different trinity. God's love toward us, when we really embrace it, spurs us on to love others profligately. Which is why, more often than not, we are afraid to do it. And when we act in love toward others, we inspire them to turn toward God, who is the source of the love they have received, a trinity. Our ancestors in the faith wisely saw that a God who is love could not possibly be monolithic because love is inherently relational. So our claim that God is a trinity is a direct consequence of our higher claim that God is love because a loving God must be eternally in loving relationship, the perfection of which is the love between creator, redeemer, and sanctifier, the love between the speaker, the word, and the action. So what about us? If we are the cathedral church of the Holy Trinity, what does this tell us about us? Or about who we are called to be? And what purpose God is calling us to, expecting of us? Whatever else it is, it must be this. We must be a place that transforms the world in love. We must be a place that creates intentional, reconciling, courageous, risk-taking love. We are meant to be in relationship with the world outside. And it must mean this as well. We cannot be true to ourselves. We cannot be true to the call God has given us unless we first treat each other with that same love. Now, my brothers and sisters, don't be alarmed. This does not mean we have to like each other. I still think of myself as new, 
But I know I've been around here long enough that at least for some of you, I am on the list of people I don't like. And that's okay, because I've been around here long enough that I'm beginning to have a list too. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. We are supposed to love each other, regardless. That's the dangerous part. Here in this community, whatever the rest of our lives are like, whatever it's like where you work or study or stay at home, we are supposed to put others here first and ourselves second. We're supposed to show mercy and forbearance and understanding. We are supposed to rejoice together, to weep together, to strive together, and to serve together. They are not options. They're not frills. Those qualities, those virtues are what we are called to be as a church named after the Trinity. Because the Trinity is the truth about a God who is love. If we fall short of that standard, then we change nothing. We help no one. And we become a cultural institution in a church-shaped museum. But if we do respond to that call, we will change the world into something more like God's dream for all of us. We will do it in ways that we cannot now possibly imagine. If we do respond to that call, nothing is beyond our grasp. A few weeks ago, I quoted from here Fritz Bauerschmidt's little book, The Love That Is God, and talking about how our Christian responsibility calls us to be friends of the risen Jesus and what it takes to be that kind of friend. When it comes to our life together, our life here in this Trinity Cathedral, what that is supposed to look like, the love that we are supposed to share with each other is the love of true friendship. Here's how Bauerschmidt describes who we are called to be. True friendship must involve a kind of forgetfulness, both of any benefits received and any gifts bestowed. Friendship must somehow involve both a single-minded concern to seek the good of our friend with a profound sense of gratitude for what we receive from our friend, all the while ignoring how much we have given and how much we receive. In this way, true human friendship dimly reflects the even more mysterious mathematics of divine human friendship in which God gives the creature everything. The creature gives the neighbor everything. And God rejoices always in this exchange of love. In the calculation of God, I somehow owe everything to the needy neighbor from whom I have received nothing. How can these things be? Are we those sorts of friends to each other? Can we become more so? What would we unleash on the world if we were? For us, those of us who have named our community after the Trinity that expresses a God we claim to be love, that is who we are called to be. So no matter what has come before, no matter how glorious our history or how hurtful our mistakes, let us be that church for each other and for the world. And then our God, who is love, will be seen and known through us. Amen.
Let us stand as we are able and profess our faith in the God who is love. We believe in one God, the, the Father, Father, the Almighty, Almighty maker, maker of heaven, heaven and earth, earth, of all that is seen and unseen. Inspired by the Spirit, we now offer our prayers to God in the name of Jesus Christ, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the fulfillment of the mission of the church, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the liberation of the children of God from the bondage of fear, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the consolation of all those who struggle with doubt or disbelief, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For renewed witness to the gospel among Christian people, laity and clergy alike, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For this cathedral of the Holy Trinity, as we hand on the faith of our ancestors, from one generation to another, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the power to live out the promises of our baptism as we seek to serve Christ in all persons, strive for justice and peace among all people, respect the dignity of every human being, and love our neighbor as ourselves. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the sick and the suffering, the lonely and the dying, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who have died and rest now in communion with you and the saints in light, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We offer up our prayers this day for those whose names have been commended to us for prayer. For Mike, Joanne, John, Charlie, Jim, Max, Walter, Isabel, Natasha, Yuri, Eleanor, Layla, Carol, Charlotte, David, Helena, Sarah, William, Claudia, George, Claudiu, Hans, Judy Ann, Bedouin, Anais, Bill, Boyd, Brian, Cretha, Phyllis, Ruth, Thomas, Amber, David, Paul, Alex, Deborah, Elizabeth, Grace, Christina, Lucy, Sarah, and Warwick, 
And we pray for those who have died, for Patricia Truck May, Michael Waddington, Caroline Hatton Jones McKenzie, Irving Curtis Jernigan Jr., Jajiga, Marinella Salima, Carolyn, uh, Geraldine Carol Barnes, and Catherine. And we offer our prayers on this day for all those who embody and share the love of God as parent, as mother, as mothers, and those who serve and nurture others in a mothering compassion. Almighty God, with tender love, we pray to you as our loving parent. Answer the prayers of your children gathered here, for we rely on you and have confidence in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you are able. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Good morning, everyone. On June 30th, sorry, June 3rd, 2007, 20 members were the first people to be in inducted into the Trinity Society. That is, they agreed to include the cathedral as part of their legacy. Uh, today, there are 70 members, including those we are going to induct today, and the society is bearing fruit um, Yet especially in these times of need. Just this morning, uh, in opening the mail, somewhat delayed, uh, I learned of two legacies of a total of $55,000 for the cathedral. Joining the Trinity Society and agreeing to include the cathedral in your estate, uh, in, your, in your estate giving, is the last great gift you can make to the cathedral. And I encourage everyone to consider it um, it's confidential. It's easy. Um, just email Trinity Society at AmericanCathedral.org. So now I would like you to meet the new and current members of the Trinity Society. I would also like to ask Edward Bates and Andrew Cleats to come forward. We will also welcome from afar Joan Johnson and Nancy and Bob Truhold. Thank you. 
Well, the American Cathedral really has become um, part of my, I think, my family here with, within Paris. It certainly is part of my identity um, as, as an American here in Paris. And so anything I could really do to support that and continue um, the great work that the cathedral does is something I want to be part of. Um, also, I think it's just such an interesting institution within Paris. I think we bring a really unique Christian perspective that you might not necessarily find in other churches. I think we're a great mix of international people. So anything I could do to sort of continue that and strengthen it and help bring it to the next generation was something I wanted to be a part of. Well, I've always so enjoyed being at the cathedral. Obviously, the wonderful pastors, Dean and associate speakers that would come in, as well as the terrific fellowship of everyone in the cathedral. I'm blessed to be able to go to Paris nearly every year for the past 15 years. And it's important in my life. And therefore, I want to recognize and gift in this way to the cathedral. <laughs> and you've, now that I think about it, you've made a very personal gift to the cathedral. Uh, some years ago. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, my daughter Lauren lived in Paris and loved Paris, and she was very good friends with Elsie Hunt, the wife of Dean Hunt, and, and therefore when she died in Paris, there was a suggestion that perhaps a fountain in the Dean's garden would be an appropriate memorial to honor her life. And so that was accomplished Especially, it's important to me to have her friends be able to visit the garden because that's really her, her life was in, in France, in Paris, and therefore I'm, I'm just so happy that it all became done. <laughs> and her spirit just is with me all the time when I'm in Paris. That's really why I go to Paris every year. Of course, the friends I've made, the joy of worshiping in the cathedral, and the music of the cathedral uh, was just a tremendous draw. So joy, joy in my heart. <laughs> well, I think a financial commitment to the cathedral is an important part of being a member and uh, supporting the cathedral for the future. And uh, as treasurer, that must be particularly relevant to you. Um, well, as treasurer, I certainly have a good view of the finances of the cathedral. And also participating with the uh, foundation and the endowment investment committee, I see the uh, the power of the endowment, and I see also the, the the future planning that the endowment can can provide for the cathedral. I would say the the cathedral means many things. It means community uh, here in Paris, uh, being part of that uh, cathedral community. I think it means uh, a place for my family as well, my children attend uh, attended uh, Sunday school and youth group and are involved with cathedral as well. So it means many things to me. Ah, um, first of all, it's very easy to do. So it's not something that's difficult to set up. So if you're thinking that it's sort of difficult administratively, it, it takes really little time. Um, and perhaps consider why or what the cathedral means to you. What did, what, what about the cathedral really spoke to you? What does it bring to you in your life? And think about how could you also create a similar experience for someone else who's in your situation or a different situation, but how can you sort of create a similar kind of experience for someone else?
here in the cathedral and at home, please rise. Andrew? Thank you, Anne. Folks, that we can put this away now. Thanks, Dennis. Everybody can be seated now. You've, you've gotten your recognition, and, and Andrew got his hardware. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the cathedral on our paternal feast day. You might have thought that it's a sign of Canon Katz's increasing enculturation that he mentioned the fact that today is Mother's Day in France. And you'd be partially right partially right. But in fact, he remembered to do that because Canon Katz's mother is with us this morning, Marcia. We're so glad you're here. So as his bishop, I'm going to make sure that he takes his mother out to lunch. Um, you have in the leaflet an interesting insert about refugee ministry. I'm just going to try to get out of the way of that light. Um, and I hope you will look at it. June 20th, which is coming, is World Refugee Day. And all throughout the convocation, our ministries to refugees and migrants are focusing on this. Our young people here in the cathedral are the ones leading our thinking and are praying about this. So you'll hear more from them about this. But do consult that brochure. And if you have any questions about it, have a word with Canon Katz or with Elizabeth, I think, who's been working on this as well. Stand up so we all see you. There she is right there. Um, many of our churches in the convocation, as you know, do direct ministry with refugees, especially in Rome at the Joel Nafuma Refugee Center and in Waterloo. So this is something dear to my heart. And we know that there are migrants in the line as guests of ours on Tuesdays and Fridays at Sandwich Ministry. So be aware, be aware. Even sooner than that is the annual meeting of the parish a week from today. I hope you will take part in it. I hope you will listen and participate. Shared governance in the church is a hallmark of what it means to be an Episcopalian. So here's your chance. This is how we do it. Before that, I understand on Wednesday, is that correct? There is a, no, the thing with the treasurer? On Thursday, thank you, correction, day on Thursday, there is an opportunity to hear from the treasurer on Zoom if you have questions about those aspects of the life of the church. I keep myself well away from that. One last word from me. This is my last Sunday with you for a while. <laughs> the dean is returning from her sabbatical in the middle of the week, and she will be back in her usual place on Sunday. I am so grateful for the welcome that you have all extended to me and to Judy. Thank you so much for making us a part of this community and for allowing me to take part in the life of Sunday worship and the pastoral ministry of the place. There are great things ahead for us to do, and I am absolutely confident that we can achieve them. I've had the privilege of working with the vestry over these last two and a half months, and I can't tell you what a remarkable group of people they are. They're so gifted and so dedicated to this place. And they're models for all of us, and me as well. So thank you. I'm not going away so that you can't find me. I'll be you know, around, but I have other things to do. So off I go. Bless you for all of that. Now, you know what I'm going to say next, right? Because it's, I always finish this way. You just heard about the Trinity Society. That is what you are meant to do with the things you can't take with you. So plan, knowing that you can't take them with you, for what you're going to do with them for the benefit of your church when you don't need them anymore. But let us now talk about the things you have with you <laughs> that the church needs to do what it does. It's what's in your purse or in your wallet or in your checking account, whatever it is, a little bit of it is an offering of thanks 
for all the joy, all the promise, all the possibility, all the challenge that you get being a part of this place. So scan the QR code or write a little check or the ushers will receive your offering on the way out. Whatever it is, it's welcome. We appreciate it. God gives thanks for it, as we do too. And it helps us to make sure the joy of this place, others will find. Bless you. Thank you. Amen. Please stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, for with your co-eternal Son and Holy Spirit, you are one God, one Lord, in trinity of persons and in unity of being. And we celebrate the one and equal glory of you, O Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we praise you, 
joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious God, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and maker of all. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, Almighty God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer to you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Christ. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Savior, by Christ and with Christ and in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
As we celebrate the unity of the God who is love on this day, I invite you to join me in this prayer that honors and acknowledges the unity of the promises of the love embodied in these gifts to those gathered in this place and all those who may join us wherever they may be. Please join me as we pray. Lord Jesus, as you promised to be with us in the bread and wine that is your body and blood, grant that we may receive you spiritually today into our hearts, minds, and souls. Stay with us. Be our companion in the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope that we may know you and have confidence in your loving care now and forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on Christ in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Please stand as you're able. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Savior, amen. And now may God, who feeds the birds of the air and leads the deer to water, who multiplied the loaves and the fishes and changed the water into wine, lead us, feed us, multiply us, and change us, that we may be bearers of God's love in a dark and hurting world. And the blessing, the mercy, and the grace of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love and pray for in heaven and on earth, this day and always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ.